Ladies and gentlemen, the college director of the Modebreak Institute of Change, Mr. Raina Davis. Nigeria is 61. Nigeria's diversity can only be complemented with its complexity and the flora of opportunity this offers us as a nation. We are at the crossroads as a nation, at the tipping point of either embracing nationhood and building on what seems to be broken promises or falling apart and finding for ourselves separate identities, possibilities, and even destinies. Things fall apart. Perhaps the center can no longer hold. This is the premise on which this address is founded, the premise that at a time when nations fall, the intervention so badly needed may need to come from above. From a kingdom that has never failed, fallen nations may draw their strength, regain their usefulness, and fulfill their God-given destiny and reason for their existence. This is the basis, this is the premise that we tonight intervene with the ancient wisdom of our kingdom to the contemporary problems of our nation using our time-tested wisdom-driven perspectives. Let us begin. New commonalities. First Peter 2.9 2, 9 says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For some, this is just the chant of well-driven Sunday school exercises. But for us, this is the basis of our existence, the reason we never fail. From one kingdom to the other, we realize that we are first chosen. Our strength lies in the fact that we were selected. The commonality for nations has to be the foundation for their prosperity. If a people have not elected themselves, if they haven't chosen to be together, therein lies their greatest problem. Most African nations have suffered this, mapped out by the colonial masters, selected by maps, some even long drawn from the north to the south. Most African nations were elected by their colonial masters. But for us to go forward, we have to drive beyond the greed of those who have no respect for our destinies. We have to move forward. We have to elect ourselves. So if the contraption of Nigeria was done by Lord Lugard, if it wasn't meant to be together, if it was driven by the idea of how much you can get from the north and then how well railed it will be to the south. From 1960, we got our independence. 
we, not Lord Lugard, have the right to choose. To choose each other. One civil war later, you would think we would have learned our lessons. There is something possible when people just say, I choose you as my neighbor. I choose you as the reason for my progress. I see potential in the other fellow. Our tribal differences are really not big enough to separate us. Our decision to stay is the beginning of our wisdom. A royal priesthood, commonality is run in every nation. And one of the things that is strongest is their concept of God. As religious as that sounds, the concept of a nation, a nation's concept of God drives its concept of itself. The fool says in his heart there is no God. At best, it's self-deceit. Because the way I see God will be the way I see men. The way I treat men will be the reflection of the way I see God. And if we are made in the image of the divine and someone believes that a cattle or a fish is more important than that image, then that nation can't be built. It has no commonality. Something inside it must say that we are made just like God. That there is value for human life. There is value for human property. Something inside it must resonate as the foundation of his justice. Thou shalt not murder. Not because murder is wrong, but because the image of God is too important to be extinguished. No nation can be built with insecurity. Insecurity based on the devaluation of human lives. Nations that are built to last must have that commonality of how they see God and how they see each other. A holy nation, a separated nation, people called out from somewhere for something. As impossible as it is for a football team to step out and win victories without a goal in mind. It's the same way you can assemble states, tribes, people, but without an undermining and underlying vision, their efforts will always be undermined. People cannot rise above vision. First, before people cannot rise above leadership. If there is no picture stronger than the color of our flag, then there's nothing that we are assembled around. There was first an American dream before Martin Luther said, I have a dream. There has to be something this nation stands for that will make us glad to be citizens. A peculiar people. And that is the concept of a bought people. Well put, it's a prized people. Because the strength of a nation is in the welfare of its citizenry. Its citizenry. If the people are well taken care of, the nation is called a strong nation. If they are well defended, it's a superpower. If there's food and there's security, then we have something to work with. But it all starts with how much value is placed on a single citizen. We we'll watch it timeless in one movie after the other. Leave no man behind. Something that seems to be fading with time. That governments exist for their citizens is the bane, the strength of how nations are formed. What is the size of Nigeria? What is the weight of Nigeria? What's the scale of a nation? It's the price of a citizen. The price it pays for one single citizen. And if the Nigeria we live in does not have a view as to what is the cost of my citizen, what are we willing to pay to see one citizen live? What happens if something happens in South Africa? What's the price of our citizens? What happens if there is xenophobia? 
what happens if there is some backlash on the Nigerian outward? Whether they are right or wrong, what is the price of our citizens? It is that price that determines whether there will be welfare, whether there will be common goods, whether there will be things done right. It's that price that determines whether there will be investment in healthcare. It's that price that determines whether there will be justice. No nation can be built without commonalities. We have come to the table and there is no going forward. It said again and again, this is the time for us, a memorandum. Let's go back, let's draft. But this starts before a memorandum, a redraft, a reorganization, a resizing. No nation can be born without these ideas, these simple ideas as the bedrock of its existence. Nigeria can be reborn, but at its place of birth, at the threshold of its existence, it must answer the question of commonality. Leading from the back seat, one of the reasons African nations as a whole and Nigeria driving them as its giants never get it right is the concept of the presidency. Our idea is simple. The stronger the leader is, the more powerful the leader is, the better the nation will be. There's something about Africa and its patriarchy. It may not be true that we are looking for better leaders. We may just be looking for a father figure who is generous. It may not be true that we are looking for better leaders. We may just be looking for more benevolent patriarchs. Because it happens time and time again, and this is how dictators are formed is that somebody is chosen with the idea that he will step out and be the deliverer. All power is vested into him, and as long as a community benefits from it, they, they invest all their lives to keep people beyond their timing, the, beyond their tenure. It's benevolence. They found a system that brings profit. Year in, year out, they'll stay with that picture until the nation is driven to the ground. But, what happens if we divest power from the presidency? What happens, if, what happens if, without a coup, we bring presidents back to their true size? The number one civil servant of a nation. There's a story in Luke 14, verse 7 to 11. Jesus, standing in a meeting, looks at the people coming to a party. He notices that everybody's looking for the high seats. He observes. And then when he's given the time to speak, he stands and says, when you come into a party, don't look for the high seats. When you come in, look for a low seat and sit there. From that low seat, the speaker, the chief party maker, the master of ceremonies, will come and look and say, you, you're more important than where you're sitting. Leave where you are and come to the front. The concept there is that the front seat is driven by those who are at the back. The ideology there is that whatever happens in front is powered by what's happening at the back. That story presupposes that no matter what, someone from the back will come to the front. And maybe the mad crumble, the rush, that mad rush for the presidency needs to cease when you realize that the front means nothing if there are no other seats. It's time for us to redefine the presidency. Not just by allocations, not just by tenures, not just by zoning, but by realizing that in every sector we are called, in every place that we are given the opportunity to serve and to lead, we are the presidents. To have agendas, plans, to design change from our area of gifting to make the presidency altogether irrelevant. It's possible because from the back seat, our relevance can be felt. From the back seat, communities can be served. So what if the country, the government of the nation, isn't helping the people, the local communities? Well, there's government on your shoulder. We can step in and make that change. What will the country look like 
when all other seats are taken when you raise the name of parties and people don't care because the people who feed them are individuals just like you when electioneering doesn't make sense because to throw a bag of rice or gary for the votes of a party has no appeal because you fed communities When you don't depend on federal infrastructure and parastatals, when you realize that the help the nation needs, the health care can happen by you deciding what's the value of a citizen. When we step out in mass with this simple idea, when we move forward and create this change, presidents will be stripped back to their normal size. Important, no doubt, but not all powerful. And perhaps that mad dash to the presidency will be curbed by people who truly want to serve because of our example. Water into wine. This event happened in John 2 from verse 1 to 11. An interesting account was Jesus standing with Mary and his disciples outside the party, a wedding incident. And then they came and told Mary, there's no more wine in the party. And when they told her that simple tale, she said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Jesus' reluctance was overpowered by his mother's insistence. And right after that, here's what he told them to do. Take those stone jars, fill it up with water. And when they got the stone jars and filled it with water, they took those stone jars, he said, bear it and give it to the governor. They took the stone jars, now filled with water, lifted up the weights and brought it to the governor of the party. After taking a sip of the water, now turned wine. He said, why did you do this? Why did you keep the best wine for last? Usually people bring the best wine first. Then when people are drunk, they bring the other wine. But this wine you brought is better than the wine we had in the party. This isn't just the parable. This is a parallel. And the parallel doesn't start from the fact that water turned into wine, which is the miraculous element. It starts with where water was poured into in the first place. Those stone jars in Jewish times were for ceremonial cleaning. They were the jars that you washed your hands in. They were the equivalent of sinks. Jesus giving an opportunity the governor of our kingdom that has never failed given an opportunity to bring wine to the places the echelons of power the places of importance chose sinks wash basins it's not just a lesson in hygiene it's actually a lesson in value that a country will not be more than the investment it makes in its citizens And whatever it doesn't have, it has to produce. It has to change water into wine. That the thoughts we see and the bandits we hear of are all potentials. Stone jars that the nation may have despised, thrown away. Visionlessness will allow those stone jars to remain where they are, good for nothing. But vision calls stone jars and fills them up. It's not just a leadership problem we have. It's a value problem. It's the way leaders see their citizens. It's the way people look at this country. What do you see when you see the Alimajiri at the north? Do you see a nuisance to be? What do you see when you see that young child in the Niger Delta without any opportunity for schooling do you see a militant to be or do we collectively see stone jars where water can turn into wine dealing with dry bones ezekiel 37 verse 3 to 14 has an amazing account it's a story of god calling the prophet to a mass grave 
and showing him bones and asked him, Prophet, can this, uh, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Ezekiel's reply is, God, you know. Because behold, he says it was very dry. And God says, call the wind and prophesy to these bones. Ezekiel does exactly what he's told. He calls the wind and he prophesies to the bones. And he does it the first time and the bones join to bones and he forms a great army. Bones join to bones, sinews and flesh comes upon it, but it's lifeless. God asks the question again, can these things live? Ezekiel's answer is, you know. God says, prophesy again. And the wind comes over the newly formed army, which at this point is lifeless. And the scripture says they become an exceedingly great army. Is this, are the scriptures written to tell us about stories of cemeteries? Or is this kingdom giving a template for where fallen kingdoms can build up from? The Nigerian situation isn't just one of isn't one of hope. Isn't one that is still carrying the possibility of change. At some point, people need to have the power to call bones bones. And if 61 years ago, it was already said we are heading down a slippery slope, where would we be by now? In the pathway of generational debt, setting up our children and our children's children to be legitimate slaves to some other empire of that time because of the deals we are making now. On the surface, it's not out of place for us to say it's bones we see. But there is a wind that can make that difference. Bones will connect to bones. Flesh and sinews will come into place. And that wind will bring life. And that's the map. The threefold map for how we can build things. That even if things have gotten very dry, bones can still connect. We can build back better. We can turn this nation around. We can work with what is forgotten. What the point is, is that God can work with bones. This is not a question of it has fallen beyond repair. It's a question of it is very dry and God is exceedingly glad. Because there are people that will step out. Repairers of the breach. Repairers of the waste places. Those who deal with desolation. Those who work with bones. While others say, this is a fear. They call it a confederacy against them. We see bones that can connect. While others see the cults, we see bones that can connect. While others see the youths, we see bones that can connect. While others see restiveness, we see bones that can connect. People can have detailed plans for this country. The time has come that we will not just hear people's promises, but people's plans. The presidential debates that will issue will not just show people saying what they will do, but how they will do it. No promises of ending corruption without a plan, a well-fleshed out plan. We, do not, we no longer want to hear what you will do when you are president. We would like to see how you will do it now. We would like to see the think tanks that go around you, the thought processes that frame you. The day is coming and now is where this country will not be fooled by promises. A generation has risen that will no longer be sabotaged by false hopes. And when you turn the tables, it falls to us. It's not just prayer or declarations or prophecies or promises. It's a strategic plan to work with bones and build a new future. Nigeria is falling way beyond expectation. And it's okay if people don't feel right to dream again. But what's glad, what's, the, what's our joy, and what our gladness is, is that there is a generation that walks with bones, that receives the plans, 
and has the wind on their side. Dealing with diversity. In Exodus 28, there's the story of the high priest and all the tribes of Israel nested on his chest. Different gems for different tribes. And this was long, long, long before modern nations were formed. Diversity is not altogether strange to God. All of the tribes of Israel, that ancient kingdom that has somehow surpassed all his fellows by being alive beyond the nations of his time, was built on the fabric of diversity. That we are different could be our strength. It could be our asset. That we think differently should be to our advantage. It just means we are un undefeatable. We, we have strengths you know nothing about. We have those who use their spares. We have those who use their slings. We are a mouthful for the enemy. The enemies of our state can't quite figure out all we can do. We're amphibious. We're desert dwellers. We stay in water. We walk as nomads. We have something here. What people call impossibility, it's not just whether the cup is empty or the cup is full. It's that we have a cup. We have a cup. We have a platform. All we need is a different way to think. All we need is to see that we have a cup. Our cultural differences are not big enough to tear us apart. Everything you see is a construct of politicians who do not want to let go of power. There is no human possibility that the hate we have for each other was not given to us by inheritance. If Nigerians we are called one after the other to talk to speak about their own personal experiences with people from other tribes you would have more good stories than evil we choose differently we choose this diversity we choose the strength it brings when the high priest was to enter into the Holy of Holies, how it was known that he was there, was that when the Shekinah light of God sprang forth from the sides of the tent, you would see the colors glow. And as the colors flow in their display, you could tell that God is here. That God wants to show himself through our difference is the reason for a nation as complex as this, diverse as this. What men see as impossible is always possible with God. The tailor, the carpenter, and the nation builder. If you were asked, what does the tailor have to do for making a nation come out right? What does the carpenter have to offer that will make our political processes work better? How will our army be made better? By a seamstress. <laughs> Tell her. You chuckle. Because these things seemingly are never connected. But that's the thing about how nations are born. And that's the thing about how connected we are. Let's take another example. Let's keep the tailor and let's keep the carpenter. What if the tailor was to say to the carpenter? Or the carpenter was to say to the tailor, I can help you so better. <laughs> that chuckle again. Because the carpenter knows, or the tailor knows, <laughs> that the carpenter doesn't sew. But it's carpenter makes wooden tables. And the tailor needs to cut on wooden tables. The carpenter makes mannequins, makes cups. And the tailor needs to fit what they are doing on those things. The interdependency of seemingly unconnected things. 
is the strength is the strength is how nations are built so when we all focus on trying to make our political systems better why we abandon our education we fuel the mindset that creates the monsters because the measure remains unchanged as long as our children think the way they think once they are adults they will think the way yesterday thought so we know investments in seemingly the uncomely the little parts the parts that don't look like they need change the biggest part remains the same what the carpenter knows what the tailor knows is that when it's time to change a country forget about being the hero find one sector and change that sector as it stands we don't want a president that will give us light we know that's impossible with man we want someone with a smaller plan someone who can come to a sector and say we'll make tailors tailors right we'll make plumbers plumbers right we'll make them we'll make this simple sector work and the chain re reaction the butterfly effect of making one small change in a system it ricochets round the whole system and inspires change if we can only see the picture of one thing working we're seeing a new breed of leaders who are not just taking mouthfuls they can't swallow but bites fools they can chew on change where it really matters uncommonly uncommon but effective three big words redemption reconciliation and repentance that our whole christian faith is anchored on the redemption is that we were lost and someone deemed us costly enough worthy enough to buy us back reconciliation is that we cost the fight but someone wanted us valued us so much that he was ready to be the one who settled repentance is that we have a message that says change your mind the quarrel is over god is no longer mad at you there is now peace between you the rebel and god the benevolent father yes these are the tenets of our faith but this is the base rock of every nation that will go forward redemption because that's what governments must do to stand up again they have to look to their people and redeem them by redeem we mean to put what back into them that the next generation of leaders must be people who will look at not only the part of Nigeria they are from but the whole of Nigeria and say I deem that cattle rare that nomad I deem that tribe I deem that fisherman I deem that farmer and I deem them worthy of a better life this is the beginning of the discussion of change redemption reconciliation because the fight is that we always had a fight we had a civil war we should have another how far back will we go what did Kagama know? How was it settled in the nation of Somalia? Why didn't they look for who caused it? Because justice is, if there is a man who did wrong, he should be brought to book. But what if it's a race that did wrong? What justice do you have for slavery? You have no justice. 
you have only reconciliation. And you who didn't cause it will have to be the bigger one to even look at those who caused it and say, I release you. If we must build, if we must dwell at some point, finger pointing, blaming the other fellow, long histories of how the Hausa and how the Igbo and how the Niger Delta has to disappear from our politics. Reconciliation has to be the bane. People saying, how we plan to, how we plan to increase you, improve you, help you. Repentance means to think again. It means if you think all these things are impossible, think again. With God, all things are possible. We've looked to ourselves long enough. It's time to look up to a kingdom that has never failed with principles that never fall. Providing solutions for broken systems can be capricious and no one size fits all. Applications of ideas can vary in verity. But one thing stands sure. This is the age in this country where new voices come to the table and new ideas are brought to the foreground. Nigeria is not only redeemable, it can be made a truly great nation. This generation rises up to build from the ruins, a country of diversity and opportunity, a cradle for new civilizations, a beacon of hope for all nations to behold. Happy 61st, Nigeria.